A warm welcome to everyone and thank you for joining this Hardman & Co Investor Forum. My name is Keith Hiscock and I'm the Chief Executive of Hardman & Co. These forums give investors the chance to hear a company's investment case and question the management. Our first presentation comes from BBGI. This is an investment company which owns infrastructure assets and collects revenue based on availability, not usage. It's got a market cap of 1.2 billion. It's got a yield of just under 5%. Uh, and we're very lucky to be joined today by uh, both of the co-chief executives, Duncan Ball and Frank Schrem. Gentlemen, over to you. Thank you, Keith, for the, uh, for the nice introduction. And uh, thanks and warm welcome also to everyone here on the call. Um, I will lead you to this, to this presentation. And uh, my name is Frank Schramm. And uh, together with um, Duncan Ball, I will present that. Um, BBGI, uh, Global Infrastructure, setting the scene of the different infrastructure asset classes. This gives an overview. Uh, this infrastructure excludes renewable energy because that's typically a separate asset class and uh, that's the view of most actually analysts. Um, the different asset classes here covered are PPP, which is more generally also called availability-based assets, then actually um, regulated assets such as gas, electricity, or water transmission, networks, coal roads, ports and airports. Starting with the PPP asset class, the income stream comes from availability fees, which are long-term contracted and are not subject to demand risk. As long as the hospital, fire stations, schools, uh, police stations, roads are made available to the public sector client, the client is obliged to pay the availability fee. This is the reason why operational PPP projects have experienced no marginal impacts from COVID-19. As the risk rates have reduced further um, in the last couple of years, this also had a positive impact on valuations. As discount rates are also coming down further, um, there's probably more upside in the market. Regulated assets is the second asset class here I want to cover. Um, the impact from COVID-19 was limited, but the pressure on valuation came from a different direction, the regulator. In the UK, the allowable returns have been significantly reduced over the last couple of years. Previously, have been around 7%. And this had come down in the recent pricing rounds uh, and where the regulator set the new actual returns to around 4% for gas and water assets. This clearly had also a negative impact on valuations. On toll roads, traffic have reduced significantly. You may see that with your own actually our traveling patterns there, which have probably been reduced. And according to a recent PwC study, the negative on impact on valuation is about 10 to 20%. There's also severe uncertainty in the market for this asset class and how the future of, of traffic will be on the roads given the um, home office you know, trend and, uh, and, and current restrictions, but also future, future actually traffic patterns are quite unclear. Ports, um, again, PwC is that similar magnitude toll roads, about 10 to 20% reduction in traffic and also likely impact. Um, airports have been the most severely hit in valuations and still, could, still very early to understand the full, full impact on the sector um, if and when pre-COVID pre traffic will be reached in the future. As we are investing in PVP and availability-based assets only, we believe we are well-placed in that environment. This slide presents the fundamentals of BBGI and our investment proposition. So what is our DNA? BBGI is a global infrastructure investor with a low-risk investment strategy, and we focus on delivering long-term sustainable returns. Our strategic pillars are low risk, globally diversified and internally managed. The strategic pillar low risk is based on our availability-based investment strategy. Yeah, and we don't invest into demand risk or higher risk other as classes like regulatory risks. Our revenues are coming from secure public sector or public sector backed counterparties. And the result is that cash flows are stable and predictable. And this helped us to deliver our progressive long-term dividend growth strategy. The global diversification pillar is based on our focused exposure to highly rated investment grade countries, which provide stable and well-developed operating environments. We have a global portfolio that serves the society through supporting global communities. The third pillar is that we are internally managed. We, and that means Duncan, I and the whole team are employed by the company yeah, and our interests are fully in line with that of investors. We focus on delivering shareholder value by being incentivized by shareholder returns and NAV per share growth. And important to note, it's not actually NAV growth, it's NAV per share growth. The quantitative benefit is that we offer very competitive low ongoing charge 
below 1%. We have also consistently delivered our objective. Our annualized share return is 10.6%, um, and well above the 78% IRR target, which we actually had on our IPO pies. In total, the shareholder return since IPO is 136.2, which means if someone invested 100,000, know, the result would be in the 30th of June last year, 236,000. And we have a street, a street, uh, received a strong or achieved a strong dividend cover of around 1.5 times, which is also not um, uh, the case in the wider market. This slide presents our robust operating model, which is focused on delivering sustainable returns over the long term. We have got three business principles, value-driven asset management, prudent financial management, and a selective acquisition strategy. Starting with the principle of value-driven asset management, which is our hands-on approach to preserve and wherever possible also to enhance the value of our assets. The NEV was 860 million uh, of June last year, and we will present our updated annual report end of March. And our portfolio is currently, we have added one more uh, PPP asset, 50 high quality PPP assets, and they perform very strong. Cash receipts were ahead of business plan, and we were very pleased to confirm you know, that the COVID-19 did not have any financial or materially material impact on our, on our, uh, on our operations. We also maintain the high level of asset availability of 99.8%, which helps to keep the customer satisfaction up. The second principle is prudent financial management. Since IPO, the dividend have grown progressively on average by 3.3% over the last eight and a half year, years, and our global portfolio has got some exposure to foreign exchange, and we have got a, good, a prudent hedging strategy in place, which aims to reduce our foreign exchange sensitivity. The five-year correlation and better uh, with the FTSE all share comparison is at 26% at 0.31, respectively, when we consider us largely uncorrelated to the wider equity market. The third operational principle is our selective acquisition strategy. We focus on availability-based assets only, and um, that's no style drift into other asset classes. And the, and the discipline approach has resulted in another accretive additional following investments in the first half of the year of around 30 million. In the second half of the year, this is not yet year in because um, that's yet to be yet to be actually announced. Here, um, announced in our annual report, another 30, around 30 million. We have had an attractive global pipeline of availability assets in Europe, North America, and Duncan will talk a bit later on our pipeline. This slide presents a projected cash flow from our portfolio. The chart presents our long-term stable and predictable cash flow resulting from our portfolio. We had strong cash received around 40 million from our investments in the first half of 2020. And as a reminder, the cash flows come from public sector or public sector by counterparties and the contracted nature of the long-term cash flows increase the predictability. The cash flows are also positively correlated to inflation with inflation link of, of around 0.5%. This slide presents our dividend growth and the development of the ongoing charge since IPO. At IPO, we promised a progressive dividend policy, and we think we delivered on this promise. Over the last eight and a half years, we have increased our dividends on average by 3.3% per year, and the dividend for 2020 was 7.18, and for 2021, the guidance is 7.33 pence per share. The chart on the right-hand side shows the development of our ongoing charge, or the expense ratio, as was previously called, uh, and since IPO, we significantly reduced our expense ratio to currently around 0.9%. This clearly also demonstrates the benefit of our internal management structure as we have got the lowest ongoing charge in our peer group. It presents the four key strengths of the portfolio. On the top, you see two boring but important facts. We invested 100% availability assets. And secondly, more than 99% of our portfolio by value is operational which means we have a low risk portfolio. On the bottom left, you see that we're truly global. We currently have 36% of our portfolio in Canada and UK is the second largest geography with 30% followed by Australia, continent, Europe and the US. All assets are located in stable, well-developed AAA or AA rated countries. The chart bottom right demonstrates our focus on availability roads and bridges, which make up 50% of the portfolio we believe that being focused on roads and bridges is good as they are simpler and easier to operate and therefore involve less risk. Other sectors are school, justice, and health. 
At this point, I will hand over to Duncan, who will lead you through the second part of our presentation. Thanks, Frank. Um, perhaps I can uh, go to slide uh, the responsible investment. There we go. Um, I just want to talk for a moment on responsible investments. We talk a little bit about the assets we have in our portfolio. We're very, very proud of the assets we have in our portfolio. We consider ourselves stewards of critical infrastructure with a strong social purpose, and we take this job very seriously. We serve a multitude of stakeholders, uh, including our investors, our employees, our partners, the communities we serve, and of course, our government clients. We have 11 healthcare projects in three countries with over 2,000 beds, serving more than 1.8 million patients per annum. Um, now more than ever uh, with COVID-19, we're very happy of our involvement in delivering critical health care. Um, our 34 schools provide a safe and inspirational learning environment for over 38,000 students. Our transportation projects uh, reduce journey times and provide safer travel for more than two, uh, uh, 240 million uh, travelers per annum. And finally, we have uh, four police stations and 10 fire stations that collectively serve 2.6 million people. I'll just talk about some of the progress we made during 2020 uh, in the areas of responsible investment. We formalized our ESG and corporate governance efforts. Uh, we've strengthened our focus on climate change mitigation. We're proud to be a signatory of the, both the UN PRI, Principles of Responsible Investment, and the UN Global Compact. We are a supporter of the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related uh, Financial Disclosure. And we recently received a, a rating of A from the uh, United Nations uh, Principles of Responsible Investment. We will publish a, a standalone ESG report uh, at the same time, uh, more or less, as our annual report in March. And uh, we will be compliant with the new SFDR regulations that relate to sustainability for EU companies. If we go to the valuation, um, I, I'd like to sort of tell you a little bit about how we value the assets in our portfolio. We use a discounted cash flow evaluation approach and, and the valuation is independently verified uh, by an independent valuation firm and of course by our auditors. The weighted average discount rate within our portfolio is 7.03%. The individual assets range from a discount rate of 6.25 to 9%. Um, and I think the, the key takeaway from this chart is to show the attractive pickup over the risk-free rates. Um, if you look at UK gilts right now, they're uh, a 10 years 46 basis points and a 30 years 1.05 uh, basis points. Our portfolio, when you look at the, the countries we're in and the, and the assets we have, uh, the, the average pickup over the risk-free rate is 6.2%. Uh, so we think in this low rate environment, our assets offer uh, you know, a very attractive uh, uh, investment thesis. The discount rates in the secondary market remain very competitive. There's been a lot of demand for these, this type of uh, infrastructure asset and uh, it's pushing up the values. That makes it um, challenging to acquire new assets, but we've been successful in doing so on a disciplined basis. And finally, um, we believe our valuation is prudent and conservative and as I say at the start, it's been independently uh, validated by a third party. I can talk a little bit about our pipeline. Uh, we're fortunate to have a very strong pipeline of opportunities, both in the primary and the secondary. Uh, primary is where we bid for new projects um, directly with governments. Secondary is where we acquire projects that have already been um, built. Um, we have a, a formal pipeline in place with a, a contracting firm in, in North America that will give us uh, the opportunity to acquire five, five assets uh, that may come uh, up for sale in, in coming years. And we're also tracking a number of um, primary and secondary opportunities. So there's no, no concern about the uh, opportunities that lie in front of us. We have a 180 million pound credit facility. Um, so we're, we have lots of dry powder to pursue those opportunities. And the, the, the overarching theme is many of the construction contractors that we work with, they've seen their balance sheets stressed by COVID. So they are selling assets and we have been active in, in acquiring assets. And we, we expect that trend to continue through 2021. 
The other trend is that um, we're expecting governments to use infrastructure spending as a stimulus to kickstart the economy. So we believe we're, we're well positioned uh, to continue to grow prudently as, as we have in the past. Just to conclude the presentation, in these changing times, we're very confident of our low risk, uh, highly resilient portfolio. We're delivering critical infrastructure, so roads, schools, justice facilities, healthcare facilities, all with a strong social purpose. All these assets are availability based. Um, we're paid by strong government counterparties with, with high credit ratings. Um, and in an environment where uh, a, a number of companies have faced challenges, where dividends have been cut, we're, we're very confident of our dividend coverage and um, the prospects we have for the future. We deliver a strong social purpose. We're committed to strong asset management. And um, with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your time and uh, open it up for any questions uh, that, that may come out. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, we're going to move on to the Q&A session now, which will last for uh, 10 minutes, and then there will be a poll after that. So we've got a number of questions here. Let's start with this one. Could Duncan explain how BBGI influenced the operators of the assets and secure the impressive ECG credentials? E.g., do BBGI have, for example, green leases in place? What are the other plans for net zero? Uh, it's a great question, very topical. Um, we, it, it's interesting when you talk about how we run these uh, health healthcare and schools and educational projects, um, there's this concept of operational control. Where we have a hospital, we can't go in and tell the hospital that they should lower the temperature by two degrees and that would so we, we have to work within the constraints of our contracts. But what we have been able to do is be more, to identify the, you know, it's, it's more, it's rather than implement, it's influence is the, is the key word. We work with the clients, we influence them, we uh, make them aware of the savings that could be available through some of these initiatives. Um, it, sometimes it's within our bailiwick, we can, we can do it. We've replaced a lot of LED lightings on our roads to reduce our carbon footprint. But I, I, with, with most of the assets, it's working closely with clients to influence them. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, disclosures, we're working, we've engaged a third party consultant to help us track our scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And we're hoping to use that information over the course of this year, um, get up to speed. And then um, I think the, the last part of the question was, our plans for net zero. Once we have that information, we, we do plan to make a, um, a statement about net zero. Okay, so um, just following on from that question from Simon, he says, could you please um, illustrate your investment process by talking how you acquired one of your recent assets? You could use the Bridge Over St. Lawrence in Canada as an example. Frank, do you wanna take that one? Sure, yeah. Um... It, the bridge over St. Lawrence was, was actually um, it's, a, it's a great showcase for us. You know? um, we have got good contacts in the industry, you know, and the seller was Hochtief, which is a German construction company, but with a large presence, PPP presence in Canada. Um, and um, they came out with the idea of selling that one. Uh, that project, they've got a 25% interest. Uh, and we checked that and it's, it's in the transport sector. It was over, it was about 30 years uh, uh, concession period. Um, it has been built, so it's operational. So it has been materially de-risked. Um, it has some inflation linkage. So from the pre-screening, it is very much in the core of our investments, of our, of our investment, what we do. And it's 100% availability and the client is a triple A rated client. So um, you can't get more in terms of uh, ticking the box, what's required as, as to be a good asset. Um, then actually the, the uh, whole team set up a, a process, a competitive process, um, and uh, they, they asked a number of bidders to provide an indicative bid. Uh, we put in a bid, we were ranked among the first, first three, as we understand. Uh, and then actually we had, um, we were asked to start due diligence or all three were asked, asked to start due diligence. And uh, we knew that actually the co-shareholder we had a preemption right would not preempt. So we, we actually gave Cortif the comfort we would start and, and the due diligence which is typically costly. Yeah, and actually uh, had an advantage for over, over the other bidders probably who didn't want to start the due diligence process. And we were very quick and completed the due diligence within four weeks and signed, an, signed the sales and purchase agreement and transferred. 
Um, it's also good to say that we have got strong relationship with our teeth, which also helps to, to have got a smooth uh, due diligence process. Um, the information were, were, uh, were um, provided in a very timely manner and very efficiently. And we're very proud of that investment. And it's a creative investment um, and it's very much fits in our, in our portfolio. I hope that you. answers the question. Yeah, I think you have. Thank you very much. So um, question from Alan, uh, what index linkage is there on projects, e.g. CPI in the UK, what indices are used? Maybe I'll take that one. Um, so we have a, a global portfolio in, it, it, it's generally linked to inflation, about 50 basis points of linkage for a hundred basis point increase in inflation. Um, it varies by region in, in the UK, it's RPI. In other um, parts of the world, it's, it's uh, the equivalent of CPI. Some of our roads have specific baskets that protect us against things like uh, labor rates, diesel prices and, and bitumen prices because that's used in asphalt resurfacing for, for highways. But it's, it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's um, across the portfolio, it's about 50 basis points of linkage. Okay, I've um, got a question. Um, you're a CCAV. Could you just explain a bit more about why you're a CCAV based in Luxembourg? From an investor point of view, what benefits does that give me? Okay, um, the, a CCAV um, is basically just to serve the form, the form actually, uh, the, the form under the, um, the usage here. Um, so what, first of all, why are we are in Luxembourg? Um, we, we actually, the, the, previous, the previous company where we acquired our seed portfolio had a presence in Luxembourg and it's quite easy for us to take that over, you know, to, to take over the office um, and actually be, be actually located in Luxembourg. Um, a lot of our peers here in, in the sector, uh, even though they might be in Guernsey or Jersey or some of them in the UK, they all go through Luxembourg here. Yeah? And then actually I've got to have got a company in Luxembourg and then actually they, they go on with the other jurisdiction. So we thought why actually adding another jurisdiction here yeah, above the Luxembourg structure, yeah, which actually adds another risk. Yeah? So we ended up saying this is Luxembourg and stop here. Um, and the CCAF, the benefit of that is that, uh, um, which is typical for usage, you know, that you don't pay taxes on, on the profits uh, you make on the Luxembourg level. That's the same actually in the Netherlands, same in Switzerland, you know, there's no different. You know, so we, but to be, to be clear, we pay taxes, each underlying project company pays taxes in its jurisdiction, but we don't pay additional taxes on our dividends or the distributions we receive in Luxembourg. Okay, thank you very much. I've got a, a couple of financial questions. Um, and then a question about shareholders, which I'll try to get through in the next four minutes. Um, so you're obviously trading at, at a very large premium to book. What control do you actually have over maintaining that level? Um, the second question, which I'll blend into this one, is that your dividend cover is, um, is way above your peer group, about 1.6%, about 1.6 times roughly. Um, does that mean BBGI investors should expect higher dividend growth in the future? So it's a, from a, a total return basis, looking at those two questions. So maybe I'll uh, try to answer them both quickly. Um, in terms of the premium, and then I'll talk about the uh, dividend cover. In terms of the premium, I think we've, we IPO'd in 2011 and we've always uh, traded at a premium, save for a, a couple of days in, in March uh, during the COVID crisis when, when all bets were off, but we quickly returned to a premium. The question is, why are we trading at a premium? I think it's it relates to the fact that we're paid by AA and AAA rated governments. Typically, we have a 7.33p uh, uh, dividend plan for 2021, and on a current share price of 172, that's that equates to about a 4.25% dividend yield, and that has been in an environment where you know gilts or 10-year gilts are 46 basis points and. 30 year gilts are just, just over 1%. So it's a nice pickup over. And then I think the other thing that has um, helped us there uh, justify the premium is that we've consistently had NAV uh, growth. We've never had a, a regression in NAV. Um, we're not subject to power prices or other things that can, can erode NAV like other, uh, other infrastructure funds have been. So I think it's this, you know, it's our ability to continue to distribute capital 
and um, the 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 stability of our cash flows that you know, these are highly contractual cash flows. So so that gives people comfort, and that's that's why the premium. And it's been it's been pretty consistent over the years. With respect to the dividend cover, the information we're sharing today is our mid-year results, which every mid-year it's it's a little higher in mid-year just because of the timing of the cash flows because not all these projects um pay out at the same time but uh, you know we're pretty comfortable we have about a 1.3 times dividend cover consistently over the year and um you know we we've conservatively managed the the portfolio we've been able to grow the dividends and we expect to do so in in the future you know there there are others that don't have the same dividend cover i can't comment on that but we you know our our portfolio is is conservatively valued conservatively geared um there's a the quick question from edward he said does your shareholder register change over time so maybe you can answer that very quickly As we, are, as we are listed on the long stock exchange and have got our, um, a healthy liquidity on the long stock exchange, which is also uh, what, what people expect as, as a listed company, the shareholder structure has changed over time. Um, but uh, it's probably fair to say that we have a, a couple of cornerstone shareholders uh, which uh, have been in since the start. Uh, they have supported us since the IPO and have grown also with our uh, over the last couple of years, over the last eight and a half years, nine years, uh, with our capital raises. Uh, but okay, thank you very much. Give me a list of company that uh, the shared register has changed over time. Fine, we're just literally out of time. Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. We've just got one quick question because we're actually out of time. Um, in responding to Brexit, this is from Nicholas. When does your status under the FCA's temporary permissions regime expire? I think it expires in two or three years. You know, I don't. I would have looked up the exact date. You know, but um, um, it, it's a great question. Uh, we're not worried. You know, if, if that if that is if that is the question, if, it, if that keeps us awake, the answer is no. Because UK wants obviously is very very much interested to keep actually its financial centre and to keep companies listed on the, on the London Stock Exchange. So we expect that is a no-brainer that we get an extension, you know, but it's also not, not a question which, which is worrying us. Thank you very much, uh, Frank and Duncan. Mm -hmm.